This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hi, I'm Steve Schwartz from Massachusetts. We have an EPSDT system, probably like you have in Georgia, that's mostly dysfunctional. Um, so the services that uh, Josh talked about that are required under the system, that is particularly the T in EPSDT, is not something that our Medicaid agency ever paid much attention to. And in fact, it's not something that most Medicaid agencies pay much attention to. If you went and talked to the director of Medicaid and asked them, what is your EPSDT program look like? They'll mostly tell you it's about well child visits. It's about taking young children to primary care doctors and having some kind of screens and evaluations done. If you ask them, by the way, do they specifically do behavioral health screens? They'll probably say, we don't know. And if you ask them the step further, by the way, if they do do behavioral health screens, how many children in Georgia have been determined to have a behavioral health condition as a result of the screen, they'll say, we have no idea. And so if the screening, which is really the front step of the process, doesn't result in some uh, clear action by the primary care doctor, then most of the promise of EPSDT will be illusory. Um, because that is the case uh, in Massachusetts, as in most states, we decided to bring a class action case to enforce the EPSDT mandate. We looked at a whole range of health and behavioral health services and decided that because the state was so far out of compliance with the statute and to bring them into compliance would require a, a virtual transformation of health care in our state, we decided to take on one part of that. We looked at behavioral health care that's mental health services. And we looked at it for children who had emotional or psychiatric disabilities. And then using the point that Josh raised earlier, um, making sure we didn't associate care with location, we tried to focus on a m mental health services that would allow children to stay in their homes, stay in their schools, and stay in their communities by giving them services that come to them rather than them going to the service. The traditional pattern in our state was that kids with serious emotional disabilities, particularly psychiatric disabilities, would get very little care. Maybe it would be outpatient services until and unless they kind of fell over the edge. When they fell over the edge, they'd be brought to a hospital or a crisis program. Then someone would intervene, whether it be child welfare, juvenile justice, or mental health, would intervene in thinking about how do we get the kid out of there the home, out of the community, into a hospital or a treatment location or a residential program setting. So our case was trying to undo that. We didn't want to wait till kids fell over the edge. We didn't want to get them removed from their homes and home community. But we wanted to do what EPSDT promises, which is to intervene early, provide preventative, corrective, and ameliorative care, and to do that where they were before they had to go from where they were to another place. That's what the Rosie D case was all about. Um, uh, we brought this case, and I'm going to try to go through this. We couldn't figure out how to get um, some of these slides moving a little faster, so I'm going to move through it fairly quickly. Um, feel free to stop me if you have questions. Remember that now what we were thinking about was a class of children, sort of all children with a uh, significant emotional condition. Um, we looked at where those kids were, and most of them at the present time when we were investigating the case were stuck someplace. They were stuck in hospitals, they were stuck in residential programs. Uh, sometimes they were even stuck in their own homes because moms couldn't go to work because they had to pay, they had to spend all their time with their kids. The kids were kicked out of school and everyone spent most of the day in the home. Um, but no one was spending any time uh, in any kind of valued integrative opportunity. Uh, we saw there were a lot of kids in the juvenile justice and child welfare systems. Many kids with serious emotional problems had been removed from their families um, because their families got frustrated. They didn't know how to deal with the problem. They were then accused of either abuse or neglect. Uh, and they realized that the kids who were being removed 
often suffered either from the trauma of the abuse and neglect or from some pre-existing emotional conditions which may have actually precipitated some of the neglect. And of course, kids um, were uh, kicked out of school and into that what you've heard of as the school to um, prison pipeline. They were out of school um, into the juvenile justice system. Juvenile judges didn't know where uh, to think about sending kids. They didn't know or didn't have many resources to divert the kids from juvenile justice facilities or detention. And so you had a very substantial percentage. The numbers are something like 70% of the juvenile justice population are children with serious emotional difficulties. The number is as high or higher in child welfare. Obviously, it's 100% in mental health. So we're talking about very, very high concentrations of children in public agencies, usually in the most expensive locations that the public agencies support, who have serious emotional difficulties. What we were looking at was what was the possibility of reversing that trend? moving the kids, pre preventing them from going into those systems, or at least preventing them from leaving their communities if they were within those service systems, keeping them in their schools, which of course is the single most important connector for kids, uh, keeping them in their communities, in their neighborhoods, and in their families. Because as soon as kids, the, the, the data on what happens to kids who go to residential services is abysmal. Kids don't get better. The vast, vast majority of kids who go to group homes or other kinds of residential placements lose their connection with their community. They can't stay in a residential program forever. So then there's a time in which they're discharged, and then they have to start all over with the difficulties of integration with their families, with their brothers and sisters, with their neighborhoods, or with their schools. Um, the response we had was a class action case that we brought where the Center for Public Representation, together with a large private law firm uh, in, in Boston. The class action case sought to compel um, intensive mental health treatment in the community. Um, so, at, so we were no longer wanting families to have to take their kids to hospitals to get crisis programs, no longer have to take their kids to offices to get therapy. Um, the case uh, was based on EPSDT, the same statute, same claims that Josh has already spoken about, the statute that would correct or ameliorate the conditions, and we required, and, and it was based on another section of the Medicaid statute as well, that says if uh, anyone needs services who's covered by Medicaid, they, they must get those services promptly. Um, after extensive discovery, a long trial, because the state insisted um, that really all EPSDT required was these well child visits, and they were doing a great job at that, um, and that they provide some basic services, and they said we are providing some basic services. Um, that was their defense. Um, ultimately, after a long trial, um, the federal judge rejected that defense, writing a 97-page opinion that began with um, a, state, an, a, a short statement about EPSDT, that he called uh, the most, um, a, a statute that is stunning in its comprehensiveness and unique to this day in its mandate for services. He then talked about what happened to children who were being removed from their homes and put in the various other state agency systems when they could be served in the community. And then he talked at the end about um, how the Commonwealth of Massachusetts had failed these kids and how kids were now left, uh, kids with serious emotional disturbance were, live, were forced um, and relegated to live out a life that he said eked out in the shadows of existence. Um, so his decision um, resulted in a um, uh, requirement that the state uh, create a new children's mental health system for Medicaid-eligible children with respect to behavioral health services. Um, I'm going to kind of just run you quickly through um, that system. And it really has um, a, a couple of basic services that I just want you to be thinking about. Um, it may be that Georgia has these. I think it's probably pretty unlikely that they do. Most states do not, although some states do. There have been a couple of other cases besides Rosie D. One in California, Arizona, Illinois, Pennsylvania, uh, that have required a similar 
array of what's called home-based services. There's some other states that have done um, at least a part of these services voluntarily. Rhode Island, Vermont, Alaska, North Carolina, um, at, where, where some home-based services are available without litigation um, because the state realizes either that they have a mandate under the federal statute um, or that they recognize it's actually a cost savings way. I, if you remember the first slide, it's talked about kids who are stuck, kids who are stuck in hospitals. If a child under Medicaid, is, it goes to a psychiatric, psychiatric hospital, Medicaid is supposed to pay for the care that is medically necessary. So as long as the child needs to be in a hospital, Medicaid is supposed to pay for the daily rate of that hospital. In Massachusetts, the daily rate for our psychiatric hospitals exceeds $500 a day. I'll bet here it's at least three or $400 at a minimum. Um, if a child is stuck in an emergency department because they wait for a day or two or three just to get into a hospital, that's often at a much higher rate, seven or $800 a day. Even though hospitals are supposed to provide medically necessary care, there's also a kind of perverse aspect of Medicaid that allows hospitals to be in reimbursed for unnecessary care. So when a child no longer needs hospitalization, but if there's no place for the kid to go, because there's not any community support systems, the hospital can still collect from Medicaid. It's called administrative necessary days, not medically necessary. It's necessary for the administration of the hospital because they can't free up the bed for the child. In Mass so in Massachusetts, we did a little investigation of administratively necessary days, which as I hope you'll get now, is the same thing as medically unnecessary days. <laughs> right? And we did, a, we did a review of how many kids were stuck and how many hospitals were getting paid for administratively necessary days. In, in Massachusetts, when we did this analysis of our, the Medicaid expenditure system, we found that Massachusetts on, in the year 2004 and five was spending an annual rate of $78 million. So the headline in our paper was Massachusetts wastes $78 million on unnecessary care. And we use that kind of notion of both waste, unnecessary, and stuck kids to bring together a media theme um, that we did in the papers for public officials, for families, and providers uh, to try to organize people around the notion that Massachusetts was wasting money. Not just it wasn't spending money, it was wasting money um, on kids who deserve much better. As a result of the court order, the court ordered these seven services, and I'm going to quickly go through them, but they should give you an idea of what a good child's mental health system would include. And even if you're not ready to bring the class action case um, to, uh, to try to um, force Georgia to do this, you might think about ways in which some of your individual clients or kids um, could get one or two of these services. So um, intensive care coordination is essentially the treatment planning process for determining what do kids need, what are their strengths and needs, what kinds of services would be useful for them, who's going to deliver them, who's going to pay for them, and how are we going to monitor them. That treatment planning process that you've heard about, it exists in most mental health service systems, is a little different for home-based services because of a couple of things. First. Uh, the theme that you want to press for kids is that uh, the current structure, probably in Georgia, usually in most states, is that some kids are in child welfare and they get a social worker from child welfare. But they also might be in their school and they have a special ed plan. And maybe they're also um, uh, at some point in time getting in trouble with the law and then they're in the juvenile justice system. And then they have another plan with another service system. And the kids are just bounced between these various different agencies, providers, care managers, or so social workers. And, the, and if you often ask a very troubled kid, they'll tell you, well, I have four plans and four social workers and nobody talks to each other. So a key difference in the service that we created here in, Mass in, in Massachusetts of, called intensive care coordination had this theme, single team, 
single plan, single set of services, regardless of what agency you're with. It's also a program, a, a, an approach to treatment planning that relies on the families. Families are key participants. They decide who comes to the team, not the doctors, not the nurses, but the families. Um, and it, it focuses on the strengths of the child um, as well as the child's needs. So this is some of the themes I talk about. We get a single plan. We have that plan integrating all of the other services or supports that a child might need or get from other agencies. Um, includes a crisis plan as well as all the different providers that will be involved. Yep? When you talk about that, where, 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 does that, where is that concept first initiated? Okay, so At what point? Well, what we, um, if you, th uh, I'm going to kind of draw a little thing up. But in the air here because we don't want, I took this PowerPoint out because we didn't have enough time. But you think about families walking along a pathway in order to get home-based services. So this is now what the new children's mental health system in Massachusetts looks like. They can go to a primary care doctor to get the screening that we've talked about, Josh mentioned. Um, if the screening was positive, meaning the child has an identified behavioral health problem, and by the way, the screening that we've set up is family-driven, that is, um, it, it, it is when the mom takes the kid into the primary care doctor, she fills out the screen, meaning she completes the instrument about how the kid's doing at home. What's her perception, or dad's, what's the parent's perception of the kid? The doctor does not get paid by Medicaid for a well child visit unless he can document and, dem and demonstrate that he did a behavioral health screen. And if the screen said, yes, the child has a behavioral health need, that he took the next step and refer the child on the pathway. Second step in the pathway is an evaluation. It can be done by any mental health professional, clinician, social worker, psychologist, etc. All of the clinicians are certified to use one standardized instrument the instrument focuses on the strengths of kids. It doesn't think about a diagnosis. It thinks about functioning. How is the kid functioning at home, in the community with his peers on the basketball court in church, and at school? And how are those relationships going? Are they a big problem? That would be a kind of a deficit in functioning. Is he doing well? Strength area. So screen, evaluation. If the evaluation determines that the child has a need for one of the home-based or Rosie D remedial services, the child goes to what has just been constructed as a kind of hub. Think of it as like the train station. In this hub, um, there is the place where the care managers kind of live, or that's their home. And, and that's where teams are organized around. Um, it's not necessarily a place as much as it is an activity that can happen in the living room. It could happen at the Y, right? Um, it could happen in an office if, you know, if people want to come there, but if the dad or people can't do it. It doesn't happen between 9 and 5. It happens when people can come. So a bunch of team meetings are Saturday morning or Wednesday evening. Um, they can happen at the church as much as at the office of the provider. So that hub is where service planning and team-based things happen. And then, like all the train tracks that come into a train station, there will be different outputs. And the child could go to any a variety of services, one or more. And I'll go through those kind of what we call sort of harder services or more concrete services in just a second. Um, so these are just, I'm going to run through them pretty quickly. There are five kind of concrete uh, services that are developed pursuant to the judgment um, in the Rosie D case. One has to do with kids with challenging behaviors in which, um, and the behaviors can be sort of real serious sort of things that, um, um, you know, people picking up stuff and throwing them around or hurting people. Or it could be, you know, much more moderate behaviors that have not uh, been able to be dealt, that really interfere with the kid's ability to be in school. Um, it could be autistic behaviors, what they call perseverative behaviors, uh, any of the kinds of things that make it hard for kids to go to school, to be in relationship, and to be with their families. That's one program. It has a clinician called a behavior therapist who will help try to figure out why does the kid do this and how to, what are the things that the kids like to do and does, where he or she will not engage in those behaviors. The whole focus of 
behavior therapy that we call in Massachusetts is around positive behavior supports. What are the things we can encourage the child to do in lieu of the things that he or she might be reverting to doing when they're feeling frustrated or sad or you know, unable to control their emotions? And there's a paraprofessional link in every one of these services. So a great deal of the help that the kids get, the supports, are where they are, on the playground, in the school, in the home, um, by folks who are working under the supervision of clinicians, but themselves are used to be kids. You know, they're 20 year olds. Um, th some of them have a lot of training because they've been to, uh, you know, they have a they might have a graduate, they could conceivably have a graduate degree, a lot of them have undergraduate degrees, um, and they're working in conjunction with, but they know the streets, they know the communities where the kids are living, they know the schools, they know how kids are getting dissed or embarrassed or whatever else it is that creates some of the frustration and the challenges that they face. Um, another th service is much more um, a familiar kind of therapy where we're talking where the kids are talking but we're seeing the family as a unit the kids don't have problems alone kids have problems as part of a unit in their family and it could be the mom who's acting really outrageous or the dad who is hurting the kid or any number of other interactions and it may play out with the kid get kicked out of school because they were you know up half the night with a lot of raucous going on or they have a brother or sister you know who's good but it is impossible under this sort of approach to think of kids as separate from their families or their communities and so to the extent there's a dynamic going on, which there usually is, just think about your family, you know, you had a dynamic in your family where someone was doing something and bouncing off of somebody else. And so that is the dynamic that we're talking about trying to relate to. Sometimes that dynamic is very strong. Uh, I mean, it could be, you know, someone working and having a lot of great valued experience in their job or in their, uh, in their church or anything else. And sometimes that dynamic can be quite destructive. Um, a third kind of service that we have is mentoring, and this is sort of the classic big brother model, a big brother, big sister sort of model, where we're finding someone that the kid can really relate to, who's not a professional, who's not giving them therapy of any type, but is giving them an example. An example of, you know, how to play basketball without throwing the ball at the kid next to you, or how to, you know, get to school uh, on time. And so a lot of it is sort of modeling positive behaviors. Um, and the fourth sort of uh, uh, program, that, or the fourth program that is set up or service is something for families. And it's to try to recognize that the families who are caring for their kids have at least a challenge to care for uh, s some, some difficult kids. And they themselves might have some needs or problems. And so we have what's called a family support worker. A family support worker is a parent of a kid um, maybe grown up, maybe a kid who's not having a difficulty right now, um, but someone who's been there, done that, um, who has credibility of being on the street and being with the family and guiding them through both that pathway that I mentioned before as well as these services. Or going with them to the school when it comes to the IEP meeting, sitting there with them as the school's telling them, you don't understand this, you're not any good about this, you're the problem, in which someone will speak up and be their voice. And the last thing we have is a crisis services in which um, the goal of crisis services is to avoid the kids from coming to the hospital so the crisis services can't be at the hospital. Um, crisis services are mobile, meaning they go to where the families are, where the crisis is. They can go to a school, a foster family, they can go to a residential program or, you know, anybody's home. Um, and as part of that um, uh, intervention, uh, they can actually stay in that location for up to 72 hours until the crisis uh, is resolved. Now, not every single crisis gets resolved. Some kids will have to be uh, removed from uh, a home or a home setting. Um, uh, but the vast, vast majority, um, and we know this from professional experience, we know it from on the ground experience, that the vast majority of crises are temporary. And if you can kind of get in there, cool everybody out, sort of settle the situation down, um, prevent it from further escalation, you can keep kids um, in their homes and home communities. Um, 
uh, in the event that we have to temporarily remove the child, part of the mobile crisis service is to have a house or an apartment or someplace where a kid can move very temporarily, only a couple of days. It's not a hospital. It doesn't have white walls. It doesn't have a nursing station. They don't pump kids up with drugs. But it's to try to provide a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week setting um, for a short period of time, no more than seven days, um, usually only a couple of days. Um, so that's the, um, those are the basic services the judge ordered. Um, he set people out to the task of designing this in a collaborative way, even though we had been battling each other for about five years in litigation. We did come up with a plan that had many of the same features. It had those seven services that I'd just been through. Um, every service is defined by eligibility criteria. That's called medical necessity. That says what kids can get in and program specifications, which says to the provider, here's the kind of staff you hire, here's the training you give them, here's what you promise families, like how long before you can get them an appointment, um, here's um, how you uh, relate to other human service agencies, um, and here's how you work as part of the team. So those are the things that sort of define the service, um, all of which is part of a Medicaid state plan. Um, I'm going to skip through the... Um, uh, the details about um, uh, the, the sort of platform and, um, and, I've, and I've sort of talked through a little bit about the um, uh, last thing I just want to mention before I open to questions is um, how the agencies relate because a key part of this is to recognize that you have kids in child welfare and kids in juvenile justice and mental health and some kids who are not in any of those state agencies. They're just being served by Medicaid. So we need to find a way in which all of those state agencies will let go a little of their territorial control, will step up to the plate and be part of a team, and will recognize that um, as part of their task, um, th they need to um, have uh, rules and guidelines for their state agency staff that understand the collaborative aspect of this whole program. And so um, each agency now has a set of protocols um, and we have um, a, uh, our state is now divided into um, like 32 regions. Um, so that's for a population of about uh, six or seven million people. Um, the regions are just geographically based. As I mentioned, like each region has a hub, like the train station. That's one provider where any family can go um, to get help. Um, we have actually 29 regions and three specialty providers. We have a specialty provider for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. We have a specialty provider um, around uh, uh, people um, who are only uh, Spanish speaking, and we try to cover and provide uh, both make sure that we have uh, staff who can communicate in native languages and also for, uh, we have a large uh, Asian population in our state. So we try to um, sort of cross cut geography with certain uh, unique characteristics of communities, be it race or gender or, uh, I mean race or, or disability. Um, and we have each of those uh, they're called community service agencies. That's the hub of the railroad station. Each of them must have a committee comprised of family members, staff of state agencies who work in that geographical location. So if they're in um, Worcester, that's a big city in the middle of our state, in case you hadn't heard of it. So there's a community service agency for Worcester. Um, the folks from child welfare, from the Worcester Child Welfare Office, the Juvenile Justice Worcester, Worcester Office, and so on, sit on this committee, along with you know, local ministers, the head of the YMCA, a variety of other community stakeholders um, and families. And their job is to try to oversee the implementation of this system in their community, to try to make sure it responds to who their community is, to beat up providers or other people or yell at them or try to get them to move if they're not taking good care of the kids um, and to hold them accountable. So it's not only families, individual families, fighting with agencies, but it's now a committee of people that include family support folks, you know, talking to the head of the agency, saying, you know, that you just, you know, I had a mom who walked into your 
you know, agency to go get uh, behavioral therapy, and they were told their kid's not sick enough. You know, who talks to people like that? You know, we don't want any more of that kind of, you know, language. And, and those are the things. Now, we just started this. Um, the services, uh, the, if you remember the slide about the timetable, the judge entered his order in 2006. By the time the final judgment and all the rest came and the plans, uh, it was 2007. It then took us a year and a half. He gave the state 20 months from the date of his final judgment to revise, reform, and restructure its children's mental health system. That 20 months ended on June 30th, 2009. The next day, services began. Uh, through a kind of separate side agreement, we agreed to stagger the services over about five months. So the last one, crisis stabilization units, goes into effect on December 1st. Um, so we're, as you can imagine, we're just in the kind of various ramp up, as they say, go live business and all those kind of language that they use. That's where we are. We have a couple of, we now have, uh, in the last two months, 2,000 families are actively engaged in intensive care coordination. Um, uh, and uh, starting in, um, uh, on October 1st, behavior services and mentoring began. The in-home therapy begins in two weeks. So there's still a lot. We're just beginning. You know, we've got the plans, we have the design, we have the court judgment, we have a lot of energy, and we have a passionate commitment to take care of kids in their homes. So let me stop and get some questions, and then, because um, we're getting near the end of the time. And I always have many questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, my first question huh? is... Oh, do we? Okay. Did this, every state generally has like a department of... of um, Health and Human Services or whatever. So this, did this require the particular division within the whole mental health services you know, stru this structure for the state of Massachusetts? They just, this, this agreement just focused on those services within that department that were geared toward children? Well, first, um, you have to think of it in, so let me try to answer it in two different ways. First, because this was a Medicaid case, the people you have to sue is the Medicaid agency. They are the one who are responsible for ensuring, as what's called the single state agency, of ensuring that the EPSDT program is delivered appropriately. Most Medicaid agencies, and ours in particular, don't provide services. They pay for services, and they usually do it through contracts with, as, as Josh was mentioning, managed care entities or providers or things like that. Um, so we sued, and therefore the defendants was the governor, because we always sue the governor, um, uh, the head of the budget agency, the head of all human services, which is like an umbrella agency over child welfare and juvenile justice and everything, um, and, and over Medicaid, it includes that, and the Medicaid director. Those were the four defendants uh, in, in the action. Um, we uh, uh, wanted to focus at the highest level possible because we understood there was a, a tension. The tension is that Medicaid is the defendant and pays for services, but a variety of human service agencies, child welfare, juvenile justice, mental health, deliver services. They have networks, they have providers, things like that. So we didn't want to go too deep. We didn't even want to go down to those agencies because we knew that this, this case would really only work, or let's say would work at the best possible level, if we were not thinking just Medicaid, if we were thinking about the various human service entities that touch the child's life, right? The only one we could not include because of our structure in our state were schools. Uh, that is, and, and we have um, a whole bunch of separate school systems, a very complicated system in our state, and so we had to leave out schools because they are not part of our human service you know, uh, 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 executive offices, they're in another thing called education. So the defendants, in effect, included all human service agencies, although technically they only included Medicaid. So we did not, we were not thinking of go down to mental health and think about the children's mental health section. We were thinking of going the other direction, go above mental health and think of human services. And I just want to know who is coordinating that? Who's coordinating it now? Yeah. Well, um, you know, fortunately, this case was brought against um, a, a string of Republican governors um, that ended with Mitt Romney. Um, 
And uh, as soon as the case really went into implementation or the, the judge had entered his final orders, we got Deval Patrick. So things have changed uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, and so Deval and uh, his Secretary of Human Services, who's a kind of really on the ground pediatrician, um, recognize that although the case doesn't technically require child welfare and juvenile justice to be at the table, it's really against Medicaid and her, um, uh, it, it, that for this to really work required an integration. So she, on her own, uh, that is, this is now called our Secretary of Human Services, set up an integrated delivery mechanism with a point person as her deputy to make sure that all the human service agencies that touch the lives of kids, at least the ones she could control, um, were working together. able to use Medicaid dollars to pay for that case management position. I remember hearing some controversy at the federal level about case management dollars um, being used under the federal Medicare money. Okay, so that, this is a, a, a tech, the short answer is yes, you can. And the next short answer is those rules, that problem went away um, with the Obama administration. But there is, um, for those who are interested, Within Medicaid, as Josh mentioned, there's a Medicaid state plan. That's the promise the state makes to the federal government about what they're going to do with Medicaid dollars. And in that plan, there's a section called EPSDT, um, and there's another section that talks about all the different services they will cover and how they'll do it and so on. Um, as a result of the judgment in the case, Massachusetts amended the plan. And in its amendment, it actually amended it twice, it made, or it made two separate amendments. One amendment says, we are going to provide case management under a particular, remember Josh mentioned the statute has 28 different sort of services there. One of them is called targeted case management. And so we're going to provide case management under that category, and here's who we're going to do it for, and here's how we're going to do it, and here's uh, our, our delivery network for that. And the second thing it did was, it, this was pretty uh, creative with the help of some national consultants, is they created a new amendment for EPSDT. And that amendment included all the other services that I just ran down, crisis and behavior and therapy, and family partners, all those things, family supports that you just saw. And they packaged it under EPSDT because they first did not want the federal government to be picking and choosing between the services saying, well, this one seems to fit our ideas, but this one doesn't. And they also wanted to get all the benefits that Josh was mentioning earlier about EPSDT. They wanted to say, these are services which they may not seem to use so conventional medical-like services, but they're necessary to prevent, correct, and ameliorate um, a children's behavioral health condition. And here's how they fit together. So there were two uh, amendments. One of them was case management. And as a result of the, uh, uh, one of the first things the Obama administration did was to revoke a Bush administration's rule that would dramatically narrow case management under Medicaid. So Bush had not finalized it, but uh, the Bush administration uh, had not finalized it, but the Obama administration revoked it. Question? How is your organization funded? Um, my reason for asking that question is as a long time legal services attorney. Um, many people may, may not know that Atlanta Legal Aid and Georgia Legal Services, the legal services programs here in Georgia, cannot do class action lawsuits because of LSC funding. So I was just wondering who funds your organization primarily? And this case funds my organization. <laughs> um, uh, we you had to bring the case, though. Well, we, we, di we did. I mean, we, um, uh, we like GAO, um, what we, we were a protection and advocacy for some years and are no longer. But we have, um, uh, we do systemic work for people with disabilities. Um, as you know, there's a federal statute called the Federal Attorney's Fees Statute that if you win the cases, you get attorney's fees. Um, uh, we, uh, of course, the downside is, or the here is you have to win the cases to get the attorney's fees. You don't get them just because you try hard. Um, so 
you can spend a lot of time and money and costs, et cetera, like that. Medicaid cases, for those who know these details, um, unlike some other cases like the, under the ADA, do not allow or do not provide the cost of the case. So we had 18 experts testify at trial. We had to pay them all, and that was not a reimbursable expense, whereas if the case had been brought under the ADA, just for reasons of statutory construction, they are. So we obviously took a big chance, but we have taken a lot of chances, and we've won on enough of them, you know. Uh, but this was definitely an all-in game uh, that we went, um, and uh, not to just create some sort of shock value, but last January, the judge awarded fees, and he awarded fees for our organization, for the private firm. Um, we had spent over, um, you know, over 10,000 hours altogether on the case, but he gave the plaintiffs over seven million dollars in fees. So that'll fund our next case. And, and, and a few more. This is either for you or Josh, or you could say it's totally outside the, the realm. But do you all have any thoughts that you're willing to share on what the physicians or medical providers' roles are or could be in the whole area of um, EPSDT? Well, the, the rules that Josh mentioned, that he, the slide that he put up about medical necessity and uh, correct and ameliorate under the Georgia Code, that's a long way home, I want to tell you. If you look at the 50 different states and their Medicaid agencies, s similar words, for, I know of only two states that have a correct or ameliorate definition, or very few. Most of them do have a statutory, regulatory, medical necessity definition. Uh, I know of only a few that have a special medical necessity definition for children, which is what this code does, and that picks up those terms like correct and ameliorate. So I think you've done a lot here um, by giving doctors um, a great deal of uh, room to sort of write the prescriptions and, and do that work. The other two things, though, that can be done, I think, is, and, and whether this can be done through legislative policy, just organizing, um, the, uh, the American Academy of Pediatricians are given a very prominent role under EPSDT to design the periodicity tables that Josh mentioned. Um, pediatricians have brought cases to enforce EPSDT in Oklahoma, Arizona, uh, Arkansas, Florida, um, and um, I think Alabama, but I'm not positive. I know the other three states. Um, uh, so the largest EPSDT case in the Midwest is Oklahoma Pediatricians for Children's Health Care. And then there's um, uh, the American Academy of Pediatricians, Arkansas chapter against the Medicaid director. So that's one thing they can do. They can be plaintiffs. Second, that they can be um, uh, key witnesses. They can tell you what is being paid for and how that works because, not surprisingly, that will drive. When we turned around and told the pediatricians in our state that, we, well, first of all, they were tremendously supportive of the lawsuit. They testified at the case. They were uh, major witnesses about how screening works right now and how screening should work. One of them testified that the screening system in Massachusetts just does not pay attention to behavioral health. That in another state where this doctor had worked, this was the head of our chapter, uh, that 16%, 13% of children are screened as having a behavioral health condition. Today, Massachusetts has now set up the system. The last piece of data that we had was we were at about 11.5%. You know, that's, think this, 11.5% of all Medicaid children having a behavioral, who have a behavioral health screen are sort of screen positive. That's tens and tens of thousands of children, you know, in, in your state. So they talked about what that meant. Um, so they can be part of the case, they can be the case as the plaintiffs, and they can be the remedy. They can be, and they could be the remedy even if you didn't have a case, because they could be the remedy by helping do what you've done. They probably helped draft that, you know, statute or that regulation in some fashion. Or at, and the last piece is um, 
we're only obviously transforming the uh, um, primary care system um, in our state around this particular issue through some massive education. And we decided, you know, no one wants to listen to Steve Schwartz talk to doctor. No doctors want to listen to me talk about how to do a behavioral health screen. So we got that American Academy, Massachusetts chapter to, we gave them a little bit of money and the state gave them a little bit of money to do an educational program for doctors about doing the behavioral health screen. Um, um, I think one of the experiences we've had is that uh, physicians kind of, there's this, it's, you try to have to, you got to get them to suspend their disbelief for a minute to sort of believe the idea that they in fact do have the capacity and authority to determine what's necessary to correct or ameliorate. And um, in our two cases we have going in federal court now, um, this is the, the crux of the matter. Who gets to decide what's what's medically necessary. And, um, you know, it's, we'll see how that plays out, but I, I think that one of the things that, that, like I said, and Steve's pointed this out, we've got this language embedded in uh, the Georgia Code now, and we need to start using it. The related piece is that the, what I've found with providers is if you've been in the system a long time, you've been beat up enough and told you either follow the rules or there will be penalties or you won't get paid or we'll come in and investigate you or we'll pull money back. Um, it can be very coercive and I think that, um, you know, that it, it, it's, you have to be gentle about trying to work with providers and be realistic about how sort of far they're able to go with you. Um, but, you know, we've, we've been fortunate to find some docs who really, you know, I, you know, this is what this kid needs. I can't believe that they are saying something else, you know, and, and I'm willing to go fight for my, my opinion and, the, and my patient. I think EPSDT has a tremendous organizing potential that has not yet been tapped in, in most places. Um, it has an organizing potential around families and, um, and, and uh, for families to realize um, uh, you know, what's possible under Medicaid. Your question about how do families know about this, one federal obligation that states have is called informing. And under that informing obligation of EPSDT, they are supposed to, you know, distribute materials, do public service announcements, all the kinds of things that help low-income families understand uh, services and opportunities. Most states don't do anything about informing. Uh, and so there is you know, there is a project or a case or a legal right that families have to demand the informing, but there's also some organizing, because who would be the best people to do the informing? You know, the families. Uh, they could do the public service announcements, or they could write the brochures about how to do it. Or even if someone wrote the brochures, they could distribute them in their community centers and healthcare programs and churches, et cetera. So families, uh, EPSDT, uh, can organize families, but it can also organize doctors. And I think that because of its um, broad scope and because of its general deference, not absolute deference, but general deference to doctors, doctors realize that they actually have a way to fight back managed care companies and a bunch of other people through EPSDT. It's not a coincidence that, you know, f three of the largest EPSDT cases are brought by doctors. Doctors don't do many cases, um, you know, that don't have to do with their rates or things like that. You know, they don't want, they're not plaintiffs, right? But they're plaintiffs in these actions. And these actions, the Pediatric Society in Arkansas, are the leading cases on EPSDT and on the discretion and role of the doctor. And just one, one related point, because Steve's talked about managed care a couple times. We've got the CMOs in Georgia. All the things that we have talked about relative to the basic concepts and rights um, apply to the CMOs. They, those kids are Medicaid eligible. They're being served uh, through Medicaid dollars. They're entitled to the, the same protections and rights that uh, are, you know, under EPSDT. Yeah, I forget the three that operate. I never remember their names, but yeah, it would no. Well, no, no, not Peach Care. No, that's S Chip. But the kids that are in the care management organizations. Um, 
yes, an Amera group, I think. Yeah, I never, I can't remember them. But that, that's that's something that I think a lot of people have um, been unsure of as well, because that's a, a whole other problem and issue. But the basic concepts of EPSDT apply. One other thing, which you mentioned the role of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and I'm fairly certain they recently, or are about to, probably recently, enrolled a whole new website specifically targeted at providing health care for children foster care. Is anyone else aware of that? And that they developed a new, I can't pronounce your word, but period periodicity schedule schedule for children in foster care that requires more frequent well checks than children who are not in foster care and all of that should be up on and accessible on the web uh, yeah I should have mentioned there is um, either for those who are interested in our particular case or just want to get some information to families about basic things like EPSDT uh, we have a site rosyd.org um, we decided to create a special site after we won the judgment um, because we, want, we weren't sure what the remedy should really look like, and we wanted to see if we could have an interactive conversation with families about a remedy so that they would. And so what we did in every stage of the planning was to send out the draft or post the thing and you know, ask different groups what they thought about. We got a fair amount of feedback, at least from a couple of the more well-organized family groups um, that really were instrumental. Um, for instance, every time we developed one of those services, we had to decide what the eligibility criteria were. We would ask families. We'd post that on rosyd.org, say, here's the proposed medical necessity. What do you think? And we'd get, you know, some mom would say, well, that's no good. That would keep my kid out of the service. So then we had to rethink it and, and try to get on with that. So you can see um, uh, there's monthly newsletters. There's lots of information. There's a particular um, subsection for families, another subsection for lawyers and advocates, and a third subsection um, for providers and researchers, um, and a lot of background. Everything we did in the case is in the library. Every single motion, plan, idea, uh, memo, it's all in the library that's on the web. What kind of time frame does Massachusetts have for full implementation? Uh, well, that's, uh, there's two ways I'd answer that. They, the, the timetable they had from the uh, judgment was 20 months, which has been extended to 24 months, for full implementation of all the services. So on December 1st, everything that the judgment will re has required will be operational. Then there's another level, though, which is um, when is it really going to be you know, at the level that we would want to have the federal court go away, um, which I think you know, will take some ripening, some maturation. Um, uh, you know, right now we have, as I think I said, 2,000 in the first two months. We have 2,000 families that are in the home base services. Um, you know, I believe that we're going to be, you know, if, and we're, they're coming on about two to 400 a month. So, you know, I think the number we're going to hit before full implementation is 15,000. So you could do the arithmetic. It's definitely going to be several years. Um, you know, for it to really all roll out. There's a lot of staff that have to be hired and trained and. And, and so on. So there's a difference between having the service be operational and having all children who need the service getting it. And then there's actually still a third time period, which is have the services being delivered in the way that is respectful of families. So that's going to take a culture shift, not just hiring a lot of people and getting a lot of capacity. It's going to take a culture shift for professionals to start listening to parents instead of telling parents how to, you know, what to do. There we go.